Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we turn to the breaking news of the day, because it's time for the European launch of the Healthy Homes Barometer 2019. It's all on your chairs, so feel free to flip through it uh, while I speak. I won't be offended uh, by that. And in this session, the idea is that we want to lift our perspective to the societal angle, which is, of course, always important. Uh, because even if I believe that all of us in this room uh, have an interest in healthy and sustainable buildings, new knowledge is still important to us, so that we understand that re the reality that our customer faces every single day with the buildings that they live in, but also what healthy buildings means from a societal angle, a societal perspective. With this year's barometer, we've chosen to focus on the youngest members of our society, our children, and this is why the title of this year's barometer is Growing Up in Unhealthy Buildings. But before I go into this year's barometer, I'll pause uh, shortly and tell you about what we've done the previous years. Because we've done a Healthy Homes Barometer since 2015. And the reason for doing that is, of course, that we want to raise uh, awareness uh, about the problem, but also, of course, the potential of working with healthy buildings. Of course, we wish to in, engage in a dialogue with people like yourselves, but also very much with lawmakers who set the boundaries uh, for building design and very much influence uh, both new and existing buildings. And you will see that, that this year uh, we've been fortunate enough to have the endorsement of a member of uh, the European Parliament, uh, Morten Helve Petersen, who is also vice chair in the so-called ITRA committee, so that is the committee in the European Parliament which has responsibility for building regulation. So, of course, very important for us as Europeans because the majority of our regulation uh, comes from Brussels. So, in the 2015 and 2016 editions, the first two we did, we took a very qualitative approach. Uh, we asked around 14,000 Europeans in 14 different countries questions around their perceptions of their home, the perception of the impact on their health, uh, etc. And with the two barometers in 17 and 18, we've taken a more quantitative approach. Uh, we had the possibility to use the Eurostat data, so the EU's uh, largest uh, database, uh, and looking into the state of European buildings. So this is also uh, the road that we've chosen to continue with this year in 2019. So we continue to use Eurostat data. We have data for, from 100,000 households all over Europe and 250,000 adults. So it is the largest and I think the only survey of its kind uh, in Europe. We've done this together with RAND Europe, which is a research partner, and they are a non-for-profit uh, policy research uh, institute, so who have been validated the claims. So, we learned in 2017 that one out of six European adults, they actually report to be living in an unhealthy home. And that's equivalent to around 80 million Europeans. Uh, which for us in Velux, uh, who have worked with uh, healthy buildings, even for us, it was a quite uh, surprisingly high uh, number. And this year's barometer finds that the situation for children is actually even more severe. So the fundamental question that we're trying to answer here, here is, are our homes making our children sick? And actually, the case is that one out of three of European children live in unhealthy homes. And that is over 26 million children, or equivalent to the whole population of Scandinavia. And the reason for this difference between children and adults um, at risk stems from the fact that there are on average more children uh, per household in countries where there are more healthy buildings. So that's one. Uh, reason. Another reason is that we see that more children live in single-family homes, where there are often more issues with mold and damp and some of the other risk factors I'll tell you about in a second. And this is, of course, a paradox, 
uh, because parents, when they are planning to, for a family, they move out or tend to move out of the city into the suburbs in search of a better environment. And we have seen it's not uh, actually not often uh, the case. So what are these very important uh, risk factors? It is factors like dampness, darkness, noise, and cold temperatures. And children who live in homes with one of the four risk factors are 1.7 times more likely to report poor health. If you have all four risk factors, it goes up to 4.2 times more likely for, to report poor health. So that's, we all obviously find that a quite large uh, number. What's also interesting is that the consequences of living with these risk factors are the same regardless of your socioeconomic status. So damp and mold and lack of light doesn't distinguish between rich and poor. Uh, so if you live in an unhealthy home, you'll get the negative health impact no matter what kind of socioeconomic status you have. But of course, there is still a social angle to it because we can see that the 20% in the lowest part of the income scale are actually 25% more prone to these health issues. So obviously there still are, there's a, a socioeconomic uh, angle. So what are these childhood issues, health issues that we're talking about? We've heard about some of them also today and even, even yesterday. It's issues like uh, eczema, pneumonia, asthma, allergies, bronchitis, uh, etc. And uh, they're all, of course, issues that has a significant impact on the health of our children. And if we look specifically at, at asthma, which is the area where we have the most knowledge, the most uh, valid data, uh, you are 40% more likely to have asthma if you live in a damp, damp home. So one of the risk factors alone uh, increases your likability for asthma with 40%. And then, of course, uh, as uh, Europeans, it's always inter interesting to see how, do the diff how is the spread across the European uh, continent. Because, of course, the percentage at risk of, ch of children at risk compared to the total number of children, of course, varies across the continent. And you can see here on the left-hand side the EU average, which is about a third, as I mentioned in the beginning. And then you have the spread across. So you'll find uh, countries that are well Above the European average, countries like Portugal, Cyprus, Lithuania, Greece, Bulgaria, Belgium, Luxembourg, the UK. And then in the other end of the spectrum, you find what you call better performing countries. And there are countries like Finland, Croatia, Estonia, Slovakia, etc. And I think an, an uh, important point here is, of course, that even if you see the spread here, you can see even in the best performing country, Finland, you still have 20% of Finnish children who live in an unhealthy home. And now you have to learn a new word. It's called DALIs, Disability Adjusted Life Years. So it's a metric used by the WHO, the World Health Organization, to measure and the comparison between an ideal health situation, that's the top part, to a life where you are kind of burdened with a certain disease. So you can say it measures the severity or the gravity of a bur the burden of an illness. And looking at just one of the health issues that could arise from unhealthy buildings, childhood asthma, we can see that around 10 to 15% of new cases of childhood asthma, they stem to dampness and mold. And if you then calculate uh, the exposure, what does that mean in terms of these dollies? How much is your life worsened by it? It amounts to 37,000 years of healthy lives lost. And this being a new metric for a lot of you, of course, what, what does this mean? Is it a lot or not? Uh, one could argue, of course, that one uh, year of lost life is because of healthy buildings is one too many. But to put it in pers into perspective, if we compare with secondhand smoking, which we've all become very aware of over the past decades, the 37,000 lost life years compares to one third of secondhand smoking. So that's what we get from just one of the risk uh, factors. When your children are not in home, they are often in school. And we can see that diseases from dampness and mold is responsible for our European children missing out 1.7 million school days a year. And that means that every child in Europe 
misses out on 2.5, two and a half school day a year, just because of one single uh, risk factor, the dampness and mold. For the rest of the risk factors, we don't have uh, valid data in order to say that. And of course, this is uh, on top of, of absence of any other kind of illness or risk factor. On the more positive side, and we've seen that also yesterday and this morning, we know we have lots of studies showing how ventilation, increased in ventilation, improved air quality can boost the student performance uh, up to 15% and maybe even higher. So looking again at, at the societal angle in terms of uh, benefits and cost, uh, living with the illness, of course, is a, is a burden to the child and the family. But if we imagine that we could increase ventilation in schools, reduce exposure to mold and dampness, we would actually gain around 300 billion euros in 2060. Looking at it from the cost angle instead, we also know that every year there is a cost of inadequate housing in Europe, which is equivalent to 200 billion euros. That is 1% of the European GDP. And if we imagine that with a snap of our th fingers, we could change the standard of uh, European housing and lift it up to modern standard, this cost would be repaid in 18 months. So I'll end on a positive note here by saying that we know exactly what we have to do. We know how we have to build our buildings and, of course, renovate the existing ones. It's about lighting, ventilation, acoustics, etc., etc., that we've spoken about today. So finally, I, I think my final word would be to say we don't have to sit around and wait for large technological discoveries within the building industry. Uh, I believe that the solutions are here today to get acting. Thank you. Thank you so much, and also thank you for raising right at the end something that nobody yeah. has said thus far, and it's very critical what you say, because otherwise there would be a tendency, ah, the cost, oh, it's an add-on, oh, it's a luxury. We have the solutions, they are exactly. there. So thank you for that. And stay with me, and yeah. for the compelling statistics as well. Very impressed about the committee, the Parliament Committee. Um, that's, that's absolutely tremendous. And also thank you for making it very clear with those statistics what's at stake. Are you staying on when I invite Marjolaine, or you're going to sit back and Whatever come suits back? Whatever you. You may sit if you like I'll to take here. a seat. Why not, I think? <laughs> we can populate the stage, can't we? Now, Marjolaine does have to go, I think, to the Parliament Parliament in not a little time, so please give her a very warm welcome back. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me back. I think, I think it is for you first to, you're going to comment, are you not? Yeah, uh, I thought it was going to be a, a question answer well, thing. Well, I was, but, but I was giving you the possibility, you're a politician, I have to be careful. <laughs> I was giving you the possibility to speak first, but we can launch directly into a sit, take yeah. a seat. Sh shall we? Take a seat. Under the branding, this is critical. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, would you like, can I open it to the floor? Yes, yeah, sure. Away? I mean, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I had maybe two or three things say your uh, two or three things. that yes. I w could add, and then we can all react. Please do. I thought it was going to be a, Very good. a, a qu yeah. question between us. You're good. You look but like a singing group there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, what I wanted to say is that it's. Um, very interesting information to mm. have because it makes it even more important uh, to work on school renovations. Mm. And uh, it is something that we are already working on in France uh, because uh, we have a special focus on public buildings, trying to renovate those uh, because it's uh, a question of being exemplary. Uh, starting with our own buildings before starting to ask the people to do the same in, in, in their own homes. And uh, on the 280 million square meters of public buildings that we have in France, 150 million are used for educational purpose. Uh, kindergarten, schools, mm. high schools, uh, universities, all of those. And we have this bet that if we renovate these buildings first, we will accelerate public knowledge. Children will see what is happening in their schools. Teachers can explain to them why it's done, and they can then tell everyone uh, at their homes and, uh, and friends, what they've learned at school, and they can push it for uh, they push can push us all forward, because who pushes us uh, better and harder than our own children, right? <laughs> and so um, 
we have also this uh, fact in France that we have estimated that poor quality of indoor mm. air is costing us 19 billions per year. That's so nice. that's uh, yeah. incre uh, incredible, right? Mm. And uh, it's to be found uh, on one of the government government's official pages, so we know about it. And uh, the ministries of health and environment have launched a plan of action in uh, 2013 to improve indoor air. So you can find all that if you want on the French uh, government's uh, websites. Um, there is one law uh, that was uh, voted in 2015 that makes it mandatory uh, to monitor the quality of the air in all schools. It's mandatory for all schools welcoming kids under 10 uh, since uh, uh, 2018, so it's already in place. It will become mandatory for all schools welcoming youth under 18 starting in January uh, 2020. And uh, all other educational establishments will have to implement that by January uh, 2023. So the regulation is here, the political uh, staff did their job. The problem is now to put it mm. into place, because the problem is uh, we so far are not following the rules that we, are vote, uh, we have voted. Mm. So we need to accelerate that and to make sure that um, people follow the rules, <laughs> which is always different, tricky in France. <laughs> enforcement, enforcement. We don't really yeah. like that word, but it's a crucial word, yeah. absolutely. So that's... Yeah, I, would I will. I mean, just to say, and I will come to you, what I find interesting is, is that when you say, well, look, you know, kids are the best multipliers, I have suddenly had this idea, I have a nine-year-old girl, of instead of me saying, now, I, instead of me saying to her, now, you listen to me, she's actually, no, you listen to me, mum. <laughs> and then off yeah, she goes yeah, with all of this. Uh -huh. <laughs> Tell me, yes. Now, no, it's just a comment. I, I think with, in terms of the school regulation that you are passing in, in France and also for, for younger children now, I think you're really showing the example for the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. Because I think it, it, it's been lacking for, for decades. We've had no work environment legislation in schools in general. We have it in our offices and, and still it's not necessarily good, good enough. But there's no work environment regulation in place in general in, in Euro European countries. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I, I think we're really missing out and, and, and uh, not helping our children to, to perform the best possible way. So, so I, I think France is really leading the way here. And I think you make an, a particularly important point at a time where um, the mantra, at least I hear it at every event I moderate, is of course, children are our future. God knows they have the pressure on them. <laughs> and yeah. then of course, we are looking at all of these big global issues of climate change and we have Greta, but you're kind of saying at the fundamental day-to-day -day life, what are we, what are we missing? Mm. Well, I, I was thinking about my... You, you were mentioning waste earlier on, yeah. the question of waste. And I was with my kid uh, a few weeks ago. Have you got earrings on, by the way? Ah, what you can hear is some lovely earrings clattering. I'm sorry about Don't that. Don't worry about it. All I was right. thinking... Earrings off. She got loose <laughs> teeth. So she can't have loose teeth. It's your earrings. Okay. No, right. <laughs> Oh, Thank God for earrings and not loose <laughs> teeth. <laughs> okay. Um, You're talking about so your was, child. Yeah, yeah, because I was with him and uh, he stopped to pick up a, a bottle that was lying on the, on the pathway. And I say, oh, my son, you're really well educated. I'm proud of you. You say, well, I don't want to die. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. So, okay. <laughs> I was a bit, uh, it's a wake up call. He's nine. He's nine. <laughs> and he told me that. And I remember when I was a kid, my mum would say, don't touch that, that's dirty. Mm. Remember? Yeah, so yeah. it's totally different. Now he's picking it up and say, I just don't want to die. Yeah. Of course I'm picking it up. So the stakes are a little bit higher <laughs> to, to... And to then you start realising that you are not picking it up when you see it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm the, I'm the old lady. I come along with my daughter and I pick up the cigarette butts from around the bin. Look, the bin is there. The butt is there. Somehow it didn't make the difference. So <laughs> I do that. Uh, we have a couple of minutes before you need to zip off to Parliament. Yep. The floor is yours. I could take two questions tops if there's anybody who shoots... Like a good student. Oh, you're a star because you're right here in the front row. Look at that. She doesn't even have to run very far, this lovely. Thank you so much. Nice and slow, nice and concise. Stand and okay. say who you are, please. Uh, Massimo Buccilli. I'm presently the president of uh, Velux France and uh, also of uh, Velux in Italy. So my question is about... Uh, it's actually a political question. Um, both in France and in Italy, uh, it is difficult to bring this... Uh, uh, concepts into historical buildings because there is a strong mm -hmm. 
uh, defense of uh, our artistic uh, monuments, which is absolutely okay. But then what is uh, your proposal as a politician to try and uh, fill that gap? Because uh, the historical buildings, and I live in one of them in Italy, are for sure n not very close to the concepts that we've been talking about this morning. Thank you. Wow. You don't no. live in the Duomo, do you? As a historical building no, in Italy, no, I was no, thinking. Uh, <laughs> I would love to, but okay. I can't afford Before it. Before <laughs> you answer, let's just see if there's one more, because it's always good to get to give you time to reflect. The gentleman here, and then at least you have some thinking time. Yes. Uh, do say who you are. Hello, thank you. <clears throat> my name is Arthur Slopinski. Hold it here, please, sir. My name is Arthur Slopinski. I'm an architect at Velux Denmark. Work with daylight a lot, and... Um, I find it very interesting to see the effects in the uh, parameter. Also, the one showing how many um, percent of unhealthy homes put children at risk of high expecting unwanted wealth issues, the one at page five. <coughs> the interesting part Everybody is turn to page five, please. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, go on. <laughs> okay. That, that's how I activate it. <laughs> and and um, the, the topping countries with the most hazardous homes are like countries like Portugal, Cyprus, and Greece which are countries where you have quite good weather, mm. where you could expect that the children might spend a lot of time outside, um, meaning that maybe in spite of living in unhealthy homes, you can actually get a lot of daylight and fresh air being outside more so time. Does, does this, uh, these numbers take this part into, uh, into consideration? Thank you, very good question. Should we start with that one? Do you mm. mind and end with yeah. you? Yes, can you? So, so the question was whether this time spent outdoors is actually part of it, and I don't believe it is. This is, this is uh, focusing on the four risk factors and, uh, and accounting for the health issues that you would have as a consequence of that. But I, I was also a little bit surprised myself, uh, but then I saw that, that the, the UK is, is still in that part, and we know for, uh, that th there's uh, issues with the building stock in, in the UK. So it might also be because da darkness is part of it, and we know in some of those countries you tend to shut off uh, the light a lot in the summer because of uh, heating concerns, so that, that, that could be part of it. But I believe there's several uh, explanations behind it. We can okay. dig into it if you're interested. But I think, no, I think the answer is broadly not element of, you know, what people are doing in their day is perhaps in those countries yeah. less. But it was a, it's an excellent point to make. And I only wish problems with building stock were the only issue that the Brits had at the <laughs> moment. But we will just leave that because, sorry, as a Brit, I have to bring that in at least once. Forgive me. So uh, for you, please, great question about, you know, historical buildings and how protective we feel about them. What can we do in this case? Well, uh, there is something about the fact that we have begun to mark history quite recently in a way. Before we started marking uh, the beginning of a history, that we have written history and such, we have also started uh, uh, feeling that evolving was kind of something that would take, us, take something away from us. If I take, for example, something like language, language has always been evolving, mm -hmm. and new words are constantly creating. Uh, created and ever since you start writing grammar, <laughs> then you start uh, stopping evolution, and that's something of the reason why uh, people are so protective of history and they are fearing that new buildings, new architecture, and um, new things will replace what they have uh, as a, a common. Uh, Remove that. Sorry, just can you pull out? Oh, you've got it out. Yeah, okay. I, I ah, have sorry, it. forgive me. So I beg your pardon. So people fear, people fear what that will do. Yeah, but exactly, because that's because that's part of who they are yeah. and of their written history. And part of the written history needs to be that it's changing as well. But as a, that's the philosophical answer to it. The pragmatic uh, answer to it is that we need to make um, the people who are protecting the buildings see. Uh, the products that can be installed because um, m most times when you see uh, an imita a wood imitation, for example, you can no longer see the difference with an actual wooden uh, frame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's something that needs to be seen to be known. And, and so they need to uh, maybe get better acquainted with the products so that they can see that it's actually no problem. Uh, and, and the 
idea behind the historic uh, philosophical question can maybe uh, be left behind to, to have more pragmatic solutions. But I think the, what you say about the philosophical is also important in the sense that Vincent Garek this morning talked about the importance of discussion, discussion. And part of that is you can't change minds unless you can present, as you say, evidence or the playful research, as we heard Carla say, but also that you take into account why people are thinking like that in the first place, which absolutely is the philosophy. Um, if it's okay, because we are at 12.13 and you need to be somewhere and uh, I'm going to keep this very dynamic, I'm not going to take more questions from the floor at this stage. You will have a chance to ask questions later, but can you give these lovely ladies a very warm round of applause, please? Thank and you thank so you much. so much for spending time with us. I'm really grateful. Well, I thank am you very, very grateful. It was very good. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for condensing so much.